All righty. So, uh, hello, welcome to the uh, October Indicator of Behavior Project uh, team meeting. Uh, I'm your host, Charlie Frick, also the chair of the IOB subproject for Open Cybersecurity Alliance. Uh, we're going to kind of go through the agenda today really quick to help outline some of the project's plans for the next year. <clears throat> and we don't have a technical talk today, and we have a small attendance of the IOB faithful, which I'm grateful to have here today. And we'll open up for a little bit of discussion towards the end. But I thought I'd just kind of jump right into getting everybody a couple quick updates. So for starters, if you've been following some of the uh, conversation on LinkedIn, you might know that we did a little bit of a big IOB tour last month in September, hence why we didn't have a September meeting. But we spoke on IOB at the Borderless Cyber Conference, sponsored by Oasis, on September 11th and 12th out at Royal Holloway in London. Then we uh, spoke with C joint uh, presentation with CISA at the National Cyber Summit in Huntsville, Alabama on September 20th and 21st. And another joint talk with CISA at the InfoSec World Conference in Orlando on September uh, 24th to 27th. Uh, just sharing for uh, the record that the talks were all fairly well received. Uh, we had pretty full rooms, even though for a few of those conferences, we were the last talk on the last of the last day. Uh, had a pretty active discussion and interest expressed across uh, government, some folks in the financial sector, as well as a few people in research and academia, who are starting to pull more of our information off GitHub, read up on it, and hope to be joining us for some of our future meetings. So, as far as outreach efforts go, I think it's. Uh, been a fairly successful effort. That said, uh, for brevity's sake, I oh we have Patrick joining in, but uh, we will talk a little bit about where we want to go next with the project. Uh, as many of you guys know, we've been talking about for a while on working with the STIC CTITC on getting uh, the IOB uh, elements adopted in the STICs. That is a long project, but we are working with the OCA's Technical Steering Committee to at least start getting all of our extensions and definitions in a common place across all the OCA projects. So we're having some meetings uh, this Friday and some of the upcoming Fridays to iron out some of the details across projects like Stick Shifter, IOB, Kestrel, Pace, et cetera on what that looks like. But to give you guys a quick little preview, I thought I would show an example of what these will look like. So let me share a screen for a second. And nothing too fancy. Uh, formatting will be a little bit different to match GitHub, but I was just using some ASCII doc representation here to give you guys the gist. Nothing earth shattering but essentially kind of description of the new objects, kind of a table breaking out the fields when applicable, including a vocabulary for things like when we're talking about our behavior classes from a few months back, anomalous, normal, emergent, and missing behaviors, ways that we want to describe it. We're including the extension. The extension definitions are inside the main repository, but we're sharing this just for completeness sake, as well as a couple examples. And we'll be submitting those for the new objects, as well as for extensions to existing objects. Some of this is where we're discussing with the TSC on, there might be some minor changes in verbiage to for cons consistency sake and making sure we don't have any conflicts because we don't want to assume that we're the only people extending things like the process observable and things like that. So those are some of the things we'll be ironing out over the coming weeks through the TSC. But wanted folks to get a chance to see an example of what this type of data looks like. If you have deep burning thoughts on how these JSON extensions should be represented, I welcome that discussion, but I will assume most people do not have a burning desire to discuss the nuance of how we write the JSON up on a web page. But if you do, I welcome the discussion. All right, that said, I thought 
in lieu of uh, technical talk, because it's been a couple months, I wanted to tell you guys about some of the efforts that we're working on both across OCA and some of our work research here at APL. So you'd be aware of some of the things that we've got on our roadmap. So I'll start with my team at APL. Uh, our sponsors at CISA have graciously given us uh, funding again for fiscal year 2024, which started 10 days ago. So we're grateful for that. And a few things we wanna do. One, something we've been meaning to make for a while. I know those that have looked at our reference implementation are familiar, it's a representation of uh, APT 37 Reaper. What we wanted to do in our lab environment is emulate a couple different styles of attacks, show what the IOB bundles would look like for those, and then compare kind of that family of detections and correlations across multiple emulated threats. So we get a better idea of how well it detects similar campaigns besides just the exact same one over again, which was kind of our entire intent for doing this. So we're gonna collect some data on that and hopefully have a small technical paper that we can share out uh, you know, across the community to just let people see what we're seeing as we kind of put this thing through its paces. Um, additionally, we are hoping to build out a couple of other examples where we can build some of the support for Cacao and OpenC2. And we'd like to make a couple examples of correlation and response workflows that take advantage of Cacao and OpenC2 and see if we can find a way to get them to execute in our environments. So that's some work that we're doing. Another thing that I think uh, I'm still working the details of how we get this piece back out into the wild, but there's an interesting uh, project on GitHub called the Sticks Modeler, which is a user interface for building Sticks bundles. We're taking a fork of that right now and doing some internal development to see what it would take for it to support the IOB objects. Uh, not to jinx it, but we think it's not too heavy a lift. And then we want to go through the whole public release and try and coordinate with that project to see if they would be interested in accepting our changes or if they would like us to maintain a fork that supports some of this. But I think it's important to give folks something other than just Python than Python scripts to build these objects so you can get input from threat intel analysts as well as developers. And so that's something that we're working on. And on top of that, there's been some very active discussion across uh, some of the other projects about how IOB can better support uh, SBOM. I'm having some discussions with folks to understand <laughs> where folks see software bills of material uh, playing. I, I will say uh, that if you're interested in SBOMs for our work, GitHub automatically makes those. And so the only code that we've really shared on the project is our Python script for converting things to Neo4j. But I just wanted to make sure I'll bring up the GitHub repository so everyone can see how to get to that. If you are interested in an SBOM for things developed by uh, IOB, let me share the screen real fast. So here is our IOB project page. And you can see that stick script lives inside this directory. But if you are on GitHub and go to the Insights tab, there is a dependency graph that will let you know what uh, libraries we have called in all the code throughout the repo and a nice little button that will export an SBOM in SPDX format. That's not something we chose. That was just the default setting that GitHub exports in. If you're a Cyclone DX fan, it's very straightforward to download this repos clone this repository and run CDX gen or whatever ever other tools you prefer and you can export the SBOM in the same way. But just saying, as far as us providing SBOMs, this is the way that we'll be providing them for anything that we write 
and put on our GitHub. That said, I think there's a much larger discussion about examples and use cases of how we utilize SBOM. And I wanna have some deeper exchanges through the TSC, the CASP uh, project and the PACE project to best understand how we reflect that. I definitely wanna make sure on the record that we share that we are, we do view SBOM as a very important topic, but it might not be directly represented in these JSON objects we're using to represent adversary behavior. Uh, could be a use case I see down the road where that mm -hmm. might come into play when discussing certain types of exploits and vulnerabilities that we haven't quite used yet. But just saying that that is a topic that is a significant discussion right now, and I wanna make sure that we can support that. With, especially with having Jane here, uh, want to mention a couple things about our support with the CASP project. Back uh, at the previous PlugFest, we built some custom IOB bundles incorporating stick shifter and Kestrel along, with, along the lines of the use case there. There'll be a, another PlugFest happening in March 2024. And CASP project is very open to some ideas of how we better integrate our, our efforts together to demonstrate some capability. And towards that, there's going to be a vir some virtual events in November for us to start getting the wheels moving and get kind of be a forcing function to get some some effort going. So wanted and I'll this will be in the notes I put out in, on the Slack and the listserv. But for everyone's awareness right now, session one of the virtual plug fest will be November 30th at 11 a.m to 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. And session two will be November 30th from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. We wanted to split it up to give our members from the U.S., the EU, and the APAC uh, area opportunities where they could participate without having to be up at mm -hmm. super early or extremely late. Mm -hmm. So don't expect everybody to be at both sessions. I know that. but we wanted to make sure that we had something out there for everybody and we'll be sharing out the note cast we'll be sharing out the notes from those events so that we can uh move forward uh kurt uh korolenko my apl partner in crime i was trying to when i was going over the the overview of some of the efforts we're doing on iob this year i'm trying to think if there are any major ones that are iob related you feel i've left off so I'll hand the mic to you for a second. Yeah, um, I'm looking over it right now. So yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll be looking to push out a, a Rev3 version and maybe an alternative scenario. Um, so, so we have that That's going important. on. Did you cover that? Yeah. No, actually the one thing I didn't say was, and I'm glad that I asked you because the one thing I didn't say is, <laughs> These other experiments we're looking towards to see some additional, uh, I think mostly minor, hopefully not giant significant changes, but we'll do a revision three update in the coming year, uh, folding in any lessons learned we have from some of these events. Also with some of the members on this call, I know we've got some technical exchanges and talks coming up in the future to talk about some other ideas of ways to use IOB in a few different environments um, until we, all had a chance to meet and get our stories straight. I didn't want to go into too much detail on those right now. Happy to, but just saying we know that there's some more things we want to do both on the enterprise and some things inside uh, some more uh, automated uh, ICS-like systems as well, uh, taking advantage of the design as well as looking at the, like I said, the generation and use of these. And we hope that that'll allow us to get some more capability out there for folks, as well as I'm actively looking at opportunities where we can put these uh, behavior objects into practice during some pilot efforts. Nothing to announce at this moment, but those are some things that we are discussing with a few parties. Uh, not to sound all cloak and dagger, but don't wanna jinx anything till we actually have something a little bit more firm. So, 
that was, a, I know it's a mm -hmm. short meeting, because, but I want to just kind of give that quick overview to kind of open the door up. And Jane, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you mentioned the upcoming um, event in November and and then in preparation for, for the March event. Um, are you going to be building on your uh, existing stick shifter Kestrel use case for that? Or are you going to be extending IOB in a different use case? Or what's your thinking around that? At this moment, I'm, I'm planning to start with the example we did at the last plug fest and look for, I want to revisit that example and see what changes, if any, need to bring it up to date with the latest version version of the preference implementation that we've made. Just there might be some minor adjustments and I want to make just kind of start with that and then ideally uh, start talking to some of the open C2 folks and the cacao folks from CASP because what I'd like to do is maybe build upon those embedded cacao uh, workflows and see if we could do something that might involve some open C2 commands that could be fed to the open C2 orchestrator. I think that would be a nice next step to to take, but I'm not sure how far we'll get with that yet. I don't think there'll be a lot of progress made in including that by November, but that's definitely what I'd like to have in there by March. And as part of that, will you be doing some additional BPMN modeling? Um, we might. Uh, it, it, so it's an option we have. And so it's something I've been playing with is whether we we build probably might build BPMN and cacao simultaneously again as we don't have the uh, the cacao GUI uh, yet, and so we might do it that way. But the cacao is a little bit easier to embed the commands. We've done some previous work on embedding OpenC2 and BPMN, but mostly you need to do that through BPMN extensions that aren't really well supported by anything except your own code if you know that you added the extension. So. I, but we're going to look at that, possibly see about using some of the converters that got brought up at the last uh, at the last plug fest and see what we could share that would have kind of both versions of the response that ideally modify them to have the open C2 commands is the kind of baby steps I'd like to see. Because what I really want is at least to have a taxi server up where we could send this bundle have it pulled down and show uh, maybe a cacao tool visualizing the workflows, maybe some have a Kestrel instance run the search and use an OpenC2 orchestrator to uh, go execute some of the, either the correlations or the response. Uh, in a perfect world, that's what I, in my head, what I'd like to see, see, but no one on the CASP team except yourself has heard me say those words because this is the first time I've said them out loud. <laughs> and since the last plug fest, we now have an open C2, the actuator profile for, you know, the collaboration between open C2 and Kestrel team. So I, I anticipate that you'd be using that open C2 actuator profile, right? I would like to, yes. And so that's where it would probably be good to get some breakout sessions to figure out the best way to to pass that forward. Because right now the correlation is the Kestrel runbook and there might be a better way to go do that. And I'm open to figuring that out. Yeah, yeah. Because that it seems like that uh, a, a lot of work went in on both sides into transforming that Kestrel playbook into an actuator profile. So it'd be great to test it. Absolutely. And I know that was one of the big feedbacks from the last plug fest is we want to have these talks earlier. And so I don't know how much of this will happen before next month, but I think that'll be a big topic to bring up once we have everybody virtually in a room together so yes. that we can start making the progress to have, a, I think, a nice little demo in March. And so um, on that's, that point, that's our thoughts there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that point, Steve Relitz of Periton 
has um, let me know that he's uh, speaking to his leadership this week about getting permission to use his space. So we don't have dates yet, but oh, uh, we're working toward it. They have a very nice facility. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I promise I'll start bringing technical talks back in next month. Uh, but I wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit of housekeeping this month and kind of open the forum to see if there's some thoughts and concerns. Uh, Patrick and uh, Carter, just checking real quick. Do you all have any any topics that you wanted or questions you wanted to have answered that, ha that you haven't gotten in a while? I just want to make sure that we're listening. I found this to be very uh, informational and useful, Carl. Okay, great. I'm and good. The only thing I have is just a lack of time. So, so I time to to. I uh, understand. Uh, I'll make a general comment I, that, that I've made on a number of calls. I'm having really good success with the application of generative AI towards uh, mapping ontology concepts and even looking at converting from one data model to another. So for example, I'm focused on trying to have something just automatically because I'm too too much busy, you know, it's just too much tedious work to convert yep. uh, six 2.1 data models into a vertical type DB. And so I'm, it, it's it's demonstrated, uh, just I'm just using that as an example, the ability to understand the concepts and to lay out a substantive plan as to how one would go about it and now I'm just trying to get to the next step saying, okay, yeah, great. Go do it for me. Okay. And then actually start yeah. using to do the conversions of the data itself uh, as well. And I think there might be, a, uh, I think there's gold in them, there are hills, as we used to say out in Colorado. I, I agree with you. Uh, one of the things that I'm looking at on a different front uh, is some ways to help counter the um, GPT hallucinations. Because mm -hmm. I've gotten it, I mean, I've been doing a lot of uh, mucking around with with it and on the side with some conversions. And it it works great as long as, you, it's been working really well as long as I know enough about what I'm asking it to know when it, it starts lying. Because <laughs> it doesn't know when it's lying. I've had a, I've given it a few interesting. I've had the same problem with developers though, so, you know. Yeah. I, I had one guy working for me. I says, your code is so complex. He says, well, I'm trying to use every Vax VMS machine instruction. My my challenge, I said, is I have to use every single Vax uh, machine level instruction on my code. And I'm like. <laughs> Great. Fantastic. I know I. Way to go. Yeah. That's why we're three months late. <laughs> Just for anyway. a little bit of geek, yes. for some a little bit of geek humor, I think the folks that know will understand what was so funny about this. But I had Chat GPT uh, write me a very fully functional graphical user interface in COBOL. Okay. Did it happen? Which no, that language <laughs> absolutely cannot do cannot do that. Yeah, he absolutely but, should have been using Al Al Algol. Yeah, you know, no, not Algol. <laughs> But it it was beautiful to see. It generated tons and tons of code, and I was like, "I'm no COBOL expert, but I know for a fact that none of these libraries that it's talking about are real, <laughs> and that the well, language it, just doesn't do that." Given that it doesn't have an output device, <laughs> yes. Oh, but details. It sure <laughs> it sure did write a lot of code. I was. I was impressed with how far down the rabbit hole it went. So, so one more closing point. One of the reasons this, this yeah. thought came to me was that uh, I had been spending quite a bit of time trying to use tools to extract threat intelligence out of natural narrative language, natural language. Mm -hmm. I was making really good progress uh, with the tool uh, that unfortunately I had to leave behind in the dev world because I couldn't bring it with me. Really, you know, really, really worked well. But uh uh, I inadvertently, you could just point it at a directory of files, and it would understand XLX. It was with Don Ranta, DC3, uh, so I don't know if you're oh, yeah. and, and and so you know, it was built off of that whole sort of thing he was doing, and it did a you know a fantastic job for almost any kind of mime type out there. 
and I inadvertently pointed it at some of my XML sticks work and some of my probably Neo4j. So I inadvertently pointed it at the wrong folder structure and was like, oh, wow. I never thought about throwing natural language stuff at structured data. So that same kind of concept here is 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 was what said, you know what? You know, this might work out really well. So uh, I don't know how many of you have been on through the tedious process of trying to get with ontologists and design an ontology. Um, but, yes. uh, you know, so if there's, a, if there's the ability to uh, leverage this technology to kind of, you know, but like you said, we also have to watch out for hallucinations, you know. And I, I don't think I, would I forgot to peer review of, of my AI generated ontology with a bunch of real ontologists. I think I'd probably be uh, you know, run out of town. I'll say at the uh, at the slew of conferences I've been at, obviously there were a lot of GPT evaluations going on, and I will say, for most type of efforts, um, it's it's been scoring about a seventy percent. Uh, 60 to 70 percent on accuracy for a lot of like traditional assessments which for a language model the general language model i'd say is pretty impressive for something that wasn't built to be focused on any particular thing but you know it still needs some uh, it needs some expert review but again it's less than one year old so i'm not going to be too it's doing a lot more than i did at one year old so uh I also, that did that was a good reminder though. I forgot to mention uh, Ryan from the threat actor uh, context ontology work also is planning to start having some more elements to share with us as he's reading through the IOB reference implementation and, and it's got some thoughts on ways that those two projects could be better aligned. Whether we get that into CASP, I don't know yet, but I would love to, seeing that IOB kind of is like, the bucket structure to hold a lot of this data. I'm hoping to be able to integrate in with a lot of our efforts throughout the entire Alliance. So, cause I think we have an opportunity to touch most everything, maybe not dad CDM, but I think that CDM we're talking with some of the folks on that project. Cause I do think the approach for that is going to be very similar to the approach we took to build the IOB implementation. So, I do think there's some, I think there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And then once we can get a real demo going of showing this stuff going together, I think that gives us the next step where I'd love Charlie's wish list to, oh, I uh, might have ducked out for a second. I apologize. But I'd love to eventually get something closer to our dev environment up into a, a cloud for a CASP event where we actually could have emulated victim networks and attacker networks as well as the defender uh network to show an example of launching an attack through and testing out our combined tools together against a threat but that's i think a super stretch goal i will i will add um as an addendum to your your kind of wish list item to uh collaborate with the the dad effort um, I am involved in some initiatives in Europe where uh, they're using the OpenCTI platform to import the MITRE ATT&CK TTP matrix mm -hmm. and then also the uh, current version of the DISARM framework. To st and I've been trying to help build out the, you know, the various configurations to to make those two frameworks talk to each other. So it's not easy because OpenCTI was not created for yes. memes, narratives, and, and, and social media threat hunting. It's not purpose built and it, for that. Yes, and it does, not, it does not like changes to the data model. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least in my experience. Yeah, and it's backwards, <laughs> I might also add that it, in the implementation from observables to indicators, yes. you know, the whole representation of SDOs versus SCOs. So yeah, some issues. Yes, but um, 
it'll be interesting to keep following that because I do think, especially with Filigran Systems, a major player on the DAD effort, I expect yeah. we'll see some change some advances and we found filigran to be very responsive to yes, a lot of I like agree. we found some challenges in the past with you know, certain bugs and we found they've been pretty fast uh to monitor the github issues and address them so and now jean philippe and samuel have joined the ctitc so we'll see hopefully more integration moving a, forward pre precisely so I, I got high hopes. All right, well, you guys know me, you know I can ramble for another 28 minutes and I won't do that to you. So I just <laughs> wanted to go ahead. <laughs> Is that, are you waving bye Carter or you have a question? No, I, I was gonna ramble on a little bit myself. Can I do oh, that? Oh, please, <laughs> ramble on, good sir. Well, I, I wanna talk about the S-bomb stuff. And yes. uh, can we talk about that for just a second? Absolutely. Yeah. I am all ears. Well, one of the things that I'm really interested in is being able to generate alarms and alerts when an S-bomb isn't correct. When all of a sudden you realize that the S-bomb for this node has been modified, and maybe it's the end part of uh, an entire MITRE attack sort of campaign, but the idea is the S-bomb, I, I see all this S-bomb stuff in the industry, I've never seen an alarm and alert saying, hey, my S-bomb doesn't match, you know? Mm. And I think that's something that would fit in perfectly with this. Because um, then you can add things like metrics such as, oh, and this little library that is aberrant was called 475 times in the last five minutes, you know? If you happen to have those sort of metrics going on in the system, you realize that this aberrant library is actually being used or it's not being used. And to me, that's a behavior. That's a and something that nobody is covering right now. Anything, but I but I don't have a clear view as to the taxonomies as to whether anybody's added that to what they're doing yet. You know what I mean? Okay, that's a good idea. No, I think I think that's something we could bring up with the Pace Project and see if they're seeing anything there. Because the closest thing I can think of, like. I'm going to use the wrong word, but you remember, I think it might be called dependency bot or something like that. Like that little automation plugged into GitLab or GitHub, I mean, to tell you when like your S-bomb, your S-bomb's out of date. Well, out of date is one thing, but the assumption there is that you're just behind, right? It's yes. not That's an indication of uh, a modification of a system. Uh, it's not malware. There's no signature, no, but here. it's uh, somebody's modified the C library. Exactly. But no, that's exactly what I'm getting at is that's checking for out of date. But if we had something, a detector that was more based on the, the, the code breakdown that was scanning the code base routinely. Yeah. And it's simple. It's simply. And then we, you know, and then we get into what could detect whether the library is called. Well, yeah. And so the, the notion is just checksums on libraries that, that has to be there, right? In the S-bomb to realize that it's been modified. But the ability to turn on tracing, once you realize that the system has an incorrect S-bomb to actually turn on the sensor, to actually realize the code's actually being exercised, blah, 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 blah. And, and to me, that, that turns into one of those cyber information approaches for S-bombs rather than just simply, oh, go get the old code or go get the new code because you're out of date. And that seems to me an obvious path we can go into that should have a pretty huge sort of impact because, you know, with all that information, you ought to be able to report that, hey, something malicious is happening with the SPOM. You know? I agree. I, no, that's, that's a really cool idea. Well, okay, that's, I get credit for that one for today. <laughs> I, you, get, you get credit for that. I'll, I'll take credit for that one. But yes, yeah, so I'd like to e investigate some things like that, you know, because it then leads back into some of my earlier discussions about, well, what's the detector and what's the method of detection? Yep. And, you know, and how far did the detector go in realizing the, in, the level of impact of this particular problem? So, um, so good. I, I, that's what I'm going to be thinking about is S bombs for a couple of weeks. And yeah. I think we, and we start with, I think it might be good to start with a use case where 
we have access to all the source code rather than trying to do anything like that. Like, I don't want to try, like, personally, I don't want to try to recreate a move it or log for J. Well, log for J is a bad example, but I don't want to try and recreate a move it where I've got a combined set of source from all sorts of places to make sense out of baby steps. I think we start release where we can see the whole, the yeah, whole, the whole shebang, if you pardon me. Yeah, but there's also the notion that, you know, you don't need, you, you won't, source code won't be an active part of a practical SBOM. It's just going to be the binary libraries that this piece of software is composed of. So, you know, so there's lots of different kinds of involvement. If you want to go all the way to source code, that's great. No problem with that. But it, the practical aspect is I'm, I'm looking at an end system. I see that there's a forensics problem. I run the SBOM checker and get the list of libraries. And I see that somebody's modified something. And what do I do? You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was... I was. I think I was trying to speak a lot dumber than that, Carter. I just meant oh, the I'm first sorry. time. I want to start with. <laughs> I, I just meant like the first time we try it. I think we start with something where we have access to the source code, so oh, we okay. know definitive, so that we know definitively what the S bomb is. That's that's all I meant. Oh, and maybe give us an opportunity to, to modify it, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Th that that was all. Rather yeah. than you know, hey, let's let's start with Microsoft Word. And yeah, so you know that whole notion of it, it, you know, I like that taxonomy. So is that an emergent behavior for the S bomb to I, integrity? Is it inappropriate, or what's going on? You know, I and so how do you? I think it might be. I mm -hmm. I think it, I think the change the change could be an emergent. The activity coming out of the program, the compiled code, could be um, the. I just forgot my own taxonomy. I'm trying to, th but luckily I have it written right here. Uh, could be anomalous. I kept, right. I kept... <laughs> yeah, so so I, I'm really excited about it because I think the SBOM thing is a great idea. I just think there's not, people aren't thinking beyond just simply version control, you know? And so if I, if I see this big chunk of info that's sitting on this machine and it can, give me even a simple indication of an integrity problem or a functional problem or behavioral problem, I'm going to want to exploit it and generate an IOB for it. I like this. Okay, okay thanks. That that was my rant for the day. Cool. <laughs> it was a fantastic rant. Oh, thanks. All righty. Well, if there are any other topics, um, all ears. Otherwise, I'll let you go because I keep I keep staring at the cat and I don't want to <laughs> lose focus. It's a nice cat. Um, but okay. I was staring at the pedal board <laughs> earlier. So I was glad, glad Patrick took that off. <laughs> All right. But thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording. And uh, I don't have the technical talk for next month yet. I'm still recruiting some volunteers. If anybody has something they're burning to talk about, I'll be glad to let you in. Otherwise, uh, I'll notify everybody on the listserv and Slack once we have the talks identified. Okay. But thank Bye -bye. you all Good for to see you, everybody. Time. Have Bye a great everyone. day. You too.